Welcome to Stuff You Should Know, a production of iHeartRadio. Hey, and welcome to the podcast. I'm Josh Clark, and there's Charles W. Chuck Bryant, and here's Jerry, and this is Stuff You Should Know. And over there, the ghost of Marcus Garvey. Yes. Who, if if you are, say, um, not black, and you, or you are black and you weren't raised to know your black history, you may still be familiar with that name if you're even tangentially interested in reggae music, because he pops up a lot. Yeah. <laughs> a well, lot. Yeah. There's a great Burning Spear song called Marcus Garvey. Uh-huh. That Sinead O'Connor covered, it's not, it's, it's not that good. Um, and then there's also a great, uh, well, he just, he, not only him, but also like his teachings pop up a lot in, in reggae, like in the Peter Tosh song, African. It's 100% based on the ideas of Marcus Garvey, as we'll see. So yeah, I just wanted to make big, sure. he had a big that, impact on uh, Rastafarianism. Yes. So as, as we'll talk about later, he, he's basically considered a prophet of Rastafarianism. Like he basically is thought of among Rastafari as predicting the rise of Rastafarianism 10 years before it happened. So very prophetic. Um, and he did a lot of stuff, a huge amount of stuff. And in fact, Chuck, what I didn't realize, because I'd heard of him before, because I do like Peter Tosh and Burning Spear. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I had no idea that it, you could put him up as possibly the most impactful um, black activist in, in world history. One, he's up there in the top three easily. Yeah, I was reading a, a essay by one professor that said when he starts his uh, his teachings on Garvey, he said he tries to get the students' attention by saying, like this man started a movement that was that dwarfed the civil rights movement in number, mm-hmm. and you know students are like, huh, who? Yeah, and uh, you know depending, he's a very polarizing figure. So depending on who you talk to. I mean, everyone will agree that he was a great orator and and rallier of people. Uh, but depending on who you talk to, you might find uh, both uh, black and white historians say that he was a, a P.T. Barnum-esque charlatan mm. uh, and a bit pompous and full of himself. And other people might say, uh, no, he was the real deal and he was a, a great leader of uh, men and uh, very forward-thinking progressive views on women. Uh, at a time where especially black women were not thought of as much beyond, you know, domestic workers. Right. I noticed and, that about him, too. Yeah. And he propped them up. And, uh, you know, he was a teetotaler. He didn't believe in alcohol. He was he was a lot of things. Yeah. I saw it put very succinctly. He was complicated. He had a lot of views that even if you agreed with his general outlook, you probably view as abhorrent. Um, and you said he was polarizing. He wasn't just polarizing between, like, the the black community and the white community in the in America in South America in the Caribbean in Africa, um, he was polarizing within the black community as well. Sure. He made enemies out of a lot of people, including some really prominent black thinkers and uh, eventual civil rights leaders. Um, and one of the reasons why you know if, if you're stepping back as like a, a a person living decades and decades after Marcus Garvey lived, and there was this transition between, you know, um, blacks under enslavement in America, and then like black people transitioning into, you know, free citizens and having to go through the Jim Crow gauntlet and eventually get to civil rights. Living decades and decades after that, it's it's really easy to see, you know, the black community in in America at the turn of the last century or the last, last century, or up to the 20s or 30s the times we're talking about, as like this homogenous group that all basically subscribed and thought about the same things. Mm-hmm. But Marcus Garvey is a really great instruction in the fact that there's, that that's just such a, you, you can't paint any one group of people with one brush, and Marcus Garvey represents that, and that he was very conservative, um, and he represented a conservative way of thinking and a, a philosophy of how black Americans could move forward in a conservative way, and that put him at odds with, like, progressive thinkers, like W.E.B. Du Bois, who 
you know, had different ideas for how black people could, you know, rise up and, and um, raise themselves in America as well. So it's a, it's good. He, it, there's just so much wrapped up in his story that I, I think it, it's just going to be difficult to just get it all into one episode. Yeah, and you know, I, I guess we should say off the bat that the main uh, lightning rod and his his uh, style of radicalism and why he went up against a lot of leaders in the black community was while they were saying like, uh, hey, we need to find a way to, to work within the politics of white America and we need to uh, have white America um, assist us with these things so we can pick ourselves up by the bootstraps. Mm-hmm. He was saying, no, 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 no. Uh, we should go back to Africa and we need our own space and we shouldn't try to fit into white America and white society. And this was a a radical thing to, and we'll talk about all this in detail, but to, to do something like, uh, hey, I'd like to meet with a leader of the Ku Klux Klan in Atlanta because we have similar views on uh, going back to Africa and the Back to Africa movement. And that did not sit well within a lot of people in the black community for obvious reasons. Yeah. But he was a radical thinker and uh, – just, you know, every time I thought they should make a movie about him, like we are always saying, I finally found one where they are making a movie. Oh, that's good. Who's playing him? Do you know? I believe it's the guy that was in uh, Black Panther and Us. Uh, I can't remember oh, yeah, his name. Sure. Oh, he'd be great. I think he would. And because uh, Garvey was a, a sort of a, a large fellow. Mm-hmm. And uh, I think that it's going to focus on something we'll talk about later in the episode, which were the years that um, who uh, is, why am I completely blanking on the the worst American uh, in history? (laughs) Hoover. (laughs) Okay, yeah, J. Edgar Hoover. J. Edgar Hoover's, uh, you know, planting of of, uh, spies within his own own, uh, organization. So I think it focuses on those years. Oh, that, I I can't wait to see it because that was a pretty... It's a pretty insidious set of years for Marcus Garvey, for sure. Did I call Hoover the worst American? <laughs> he's one of them. For he's up there. He's up there with Kissinger, and oh boy, I, I feel could like go on. But I don't every time we, we uh, every time we do an episode where Hoover pops up, it's just like, and here's this awful thing he did. Yeah, I wish we could just paddle him once in a while. Sure, just bring him back and give him a spanking. Mm-hmm. And I know punishment. that's not cool, but we're talking about J. Edgar Hoover here. Okay, should we just start with sort of the nuts and bolts of who he was and w- yeah. where he was born and raised and all that good stuff? Totes, he came from Jamaica, and he lived in Jamaica while it was still under British colonial rule. It was under colonial rule for 307 years, and he was born relatively toward the end of it, but still full squarely in it. Um, and he, he was born to Marcus Garvey Sr., uh, who was a stonemason, and his mom, Sarah Jane Richards, who was a household servant. He was born in St. Anne's Bay, Jamaica, which sounds like an idyllic place, uh, in 1887. And um, although he wasn't, you know, born to wealthy parents, he was educated um, at a a colonial school, and he knew how to read, and he he was kind of bitten by the reading bug from a very early age, and that helped develop him starting pretty young. Yeah, and the fact that he was Jamaican is one thing that uh, turned a lot of African Americans uh, off, like some of the African American leaders would point out later in life. It's like this, it was this Jamaican guy, even. Like, what does he know about the American experience? Because mm-hmm. it's not like he moved to the United States when he was, you know, five years old or something like that. Like, he was born and raised Jamaican. Right. I, I don't think he moved to the U.S. until he was in his late 20s, maybe. Yeah. So that was sort of a, uh, a, a bit of a knock against him in the eyes of some African-American leaders at the time. Mm-hmm. Uh, but he was one of many kids, but the only one who survived into adulthood. And moved to Kingston at 14, and he would get a job in a print shop there, which is, I guess he learned the trade pretty well because this was the kind of work that he did off and on over the years yeah. to support himself working in different print shops. He always considered himself a journalist, I read. Yeah, and he, well, was, he started his own paper. Yeah, many of them in magazines, and um, he was a very sharp dude. Um, as demonstrated by that first print shop job, because he he started out with no experience whatsoever, and within two years he was the foreman of the printing shop, so he he, he was a quick learner. Um, and I, at some point he decided to start traveling abroad, and um, and during some formative years he ended up in in Costa Rica, 
Um, because apparently Costa Rica, Panama, these were places that people in the Americas like, kind of freely traveled to and moved to. And, and from what I can tell at the time, much the same way that like Europeans move around the EU today. Uh, yeah, he had the family there. Yeah. So he moves to Costa Rica. Yeah, he had at least an uncle there, right? I think um, so, yeah. And he got a job on a banana plantation as a timekeeper. Um and while he was carrying out this work, like basically making sure people were moving as fast as, as possible to keep everything nice and efficient, um, he was witnessing and learning at the same time that like these banana plantations owned by American and European corporate interests were having a direct, deeply negative impact on individual, you know, black Caribbean, West Indian um, people's lives, Central American people's lives too. He was in Costa Rica. That you, he, he just traced a, a line directly between that. It was a very eye-opening experience. And so we founded a, a paper uh, there in Costa Rica and started basically railing against the evils of this stuff and um, made a pretty bad name for himself among the authorities there quickly. And that's where his uncle stepped in. It was like, you need to get out of Costa Rica right now. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and he did. He went to London, uh, one of a uh, few different times he would live in London throughout his life. And this was in uh, 1912. I don't think we actually said that he was born in 1887. So I think I did. This really frames where, uh, you know, kind of the time period that he was learning all this stuff. Uh, he studied law and philosophy at Burbeck College uh, under the University of London. And again, started working for a newspaper there. And this is where he started to sort of learn about uh, Pan-Africanism a little bit more because the newspaper was one that, you know, just sort of championed that idea. And that is just sort of the notion of bringing together uh, people of African descent from all over the world uh, under one cultural identity. And that's, you know, there's a lot to it, but that's sort of a simplified way to say it. Yeah, like a lot of times you hear it referred to as the African diaspora, um, yeah. black Africans who moved from Africa, who were forcibly removed from Africa to become enslaved in the Caribbean, um, in America, um, in Canada even, um, and and that over time these people just grew more and more separate. Pan-Africanism was an idea of bringing them back together, at the very least intellectually, emotionally um, as a as a, a a nation among other nations, but mm -hmm. spread out, or as Garvey would later really kind of take up this idea, like you were saying earlier, of actually moving everybody back to Africa and being like, okay, Africa's black, you guys, Europe, America, you guys can have your your white continents. This is the black continent, but we're we're co ruling the world with you. That's just how it is. That right. was his ultimate dream, and that that was kind of what Pan Africanism envisioned in in Garvey's eyes, at least. Yeah, and that would become sort of the basis of his entire movement uh, as, as far as, like, just a cultural idea. Mm -hmm. uh, so then he goes back to Jamaica. Uh, he got married to a woman named Amy Ashwood. Uh, it was a pretty rough marriage. They were separated just after a few months. Uh, I think, in his mind, legally divorced uh, a few years <laughs> later, but... Uh, she always held on to the notion that they were never – like the, the divorce was not uh, legal. And so she went to her grave saying that she was like the true wife of Marcus Garvey. Mm -hmm. uh, but it got pretty ugly. They accused one another of uh, infidelity. Uh, he accused her of being an alcoholic. And like I said, as a teetotaler, it was something that he did not uh, believe in at all. Um, but, you know, I think it's just something about him and his ideas that regardless of this sort of nasty divorce – she stayed and worked uh, with his with his group. He founded, uh, along with her, the Universal Negro Improvement Association and African Communities League of the World. But uh, the Universal Negro Improvement Association, UNIA, is the one that really stuck and is even still around today. And she stayed and even, as we'll see later, tried to protect him when there was an attempt on his life taken. Yeah, and probably did save his life from what I read um, by putting herself in between him and his assassin's bullets. So, yeah, she definitely did a lot of the early work that he became very well known for because once he started to take off, his his name and his ideas, Garveyism is what it's called, just shot off like a rocket. And she was there for most of the groundwork of it, and then they split up shortly after that. So I could see how she'd be a little bitter about that. Yeah. And then in short order, he kind of gave her something else to be unhappy about, and that was he married Amy Jacks, spelled like Jacques. 
um, who was a Kingston native um, and was his personal secretary, but also was Amy Ashwood's close friend and maid of honor at their wedding. Yeah. <laughs> Awkward. So I think that's one reason why Amy Ashwood was a little upset about the whole thing, in in addition to doing a lot of the groundwork that he later got, you know, so much credit for and still does today. Yeah. But um, he, his and Amy Jacques, uh, Amy Jack's um, marriage lasted, I believe, until his death, correct? Until 1940? Yeah, I mean, they married in 1919. Uh, and I didn't see anywhere that they ever split up. No, I think that they did. And they had two sons, Marcus Mosiah Garvey III and Julius Winston Garvey. And Amy Amy Jacks was um, uh, was very accomplished in her own right. She came from an aristocratic Kingston family. I think her father or grandfather was mayor of Kingston. And um, she was very well educated, very well read, very intelligent. And uh, as we'll see, she helped continue Marcus Garvey's work while he was otherwise occupied for a while in the 20s. Yeah, and that, you know, that led to a little bit of, uh, I watched this really good documentary from PBS, uh, PBS Experience. Those are always really good. Yes. And uh, apparently that caused a little bit of um, internal strife within Unia was when they eventually founded, I, I think it was pretty much their most popular newspaper, uh, The Negro World. Uh, he had a page dedicated to women, and she ran that page. And uh, she, you know, she ran it like somebody should run their own page in a newspaper and apparently caused a little bit of strife within the organization because as much as he was had these progressive ideas about women and, uh, you know, propping them up, uh, not everyone at the time, even within Unia, had those same ideas. Uh, I think he tried to sort of spread that message, but, you know, there were some there were some men in the organization still that were a little bit like, who is this lady, you know? Yeah, sure. Good thing that's over and done with. Yeah, right? Solved. You want to take a break and then come back and talk a little more about Unia? Yeah, let's do it. Okay. Stuff you should know. Josh and Chuck. Stuff you should know. All right, Chuck. So we're talking about UNIA, the United Negro Improvement Association, which was the brainchild of Marcus Garvey and something he attempted first in Kingston, I believe in 1916, something like that, uh, maybe 1915. Um, and it did not quite take off. He had been inspired by Booker T. Washington's Tuskegee Institute. And in fact, he was kind of like the uh, intellectual and probably cultural heir to Booker T. Washington's ideas because yeah. Washington was a, a conservative. He believed in um, black self-enterprise, black self-sufficiency, and that black Americans working um, hard and creating a life of their own amidst white Americans would show white Americans that blacks weren't inferior. They just wouldn't be able to ignore it anymore. And then thus, white Americans, black Americans would treat one another equally. And uh, the 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 um, issue of, you know, bringing black America out of enslavement and from under Jim Crow would be solved once and for all. That was the very conservative view of Booker T. Washington. And that inspired Marcus Garvey so much that he started corresponding with Booker T. Um, and he... Uh, he was invited to America by by Washington, um, but he arrived about a year after Washington died. Never got to meet him, but he was deeply inspired by him and in a lot of ways carried on his work. Yeah, so he was a little bit late, uh, and, you know, his intention was definitely to meet with Washington. But it was, you know, this was 1916 when he moved to New York, so it's not like it is today, like, uh, you know, you can't just catch a flight up there real quick. Uh, if someone's not doing too well health wise, so he right. missed his opportunity there, but he had those same ideas, and he he basically you know would ask himself, and this is a quote: uh, "Where's the black man's government?" And he came to the conclusion that there was none; they had no representation, basically. Mm -hmm. And so he went on to say, "I will help make them," and that was his aim uh, with Unia. Uh, and like he said, it did not uh, go over too well in Jamaica, but when he got to the U.S., it really, really started to spread pretty quickly. Uh, yeah. I think the first uh, U.S. chapter was in 1917. Uh, they only had 17 members in a basement in Harlem, but he would eventually go on to buy a building in Harlem that 
hosted, you know, like 6,000 people at a time. And at the peak of his movement, he would claim that there were 6 million members. Uh, you know, it's tough to give a direct count. People in history say that he he had a knack for just sort of, and this is the P.T. Barnum side, sort of overinflating everything. Mm-hmm. So they say it probably wasn't 6 million, but I definitely saw, you know, it numbered in the millions worldwide, like yeah. over the course of of the movement. Yeah, because to say that his message resonated with people is the understatement of the year. Yeah. He he came along at a time, uh, he came to New York at a time where in America there was a real um, discord and unhappiness and uneasiness going on with black Americans, uh, a number of whom who had just returned from fighting in World War One for America. Yeah. They thought really, that would be a big turning point. Yes, huge. And, like, rightfully so. Like, they served for their country um, and were rewarded with more racism than than ever, uh, yeah. including race riots and massacres at the hands of, um, you know, white neighbors who, you know, we talked about the Tulsa massacre yeah. um, and plenty of others in, in several of our episodes. This is the time that this was going on. And so I think... I have the impression that black Americans were getting more despondent after losing hope so suddenly and violently. Yeah, um, for and sure. And also more upset at that idea. And so Marcus Garvey came along also at a time where the scientific community was saying like, oh, by the way, if you're black, you're genetically uh, inferior to white people. Sorry, that's just science. Uh, and Marcus Garvey came along and said, you know what? <laughs> These people could not be wronger. But the one thing about Garvey was, uh, and this is what kind of separated him from some of his peers uh, that were highly educated and sort of a little more of the, uh, like the the initial Back to Africa movement was started by the first uh, African-American millionaire. So a lot of times these people had money and they were uh, sort of in a higher financial class, but he really championed the working class. Mm -hmm. Uh, That's where he came up and his whole thing was... You know, these the the women that were working as domestics, which his mother did, and I think that had a big impact on his views of progressive uh ideas toward women. Mm-hmm. Uh but then the men, you know, they were they were working class men, and he said that their official seal for Unia should be a wash tub, a frying pan, a bail hook, and a mop. Right. So these these were the people he was speaking to. Yep. So and w- so ultimately he created this this um idea, this concept that's referred to as Garveyism, and it, in a nutshell, is basically taking America's, um, you know, faith and the ability to succeed through hard work and enterprise and ingenuity and, um, you know, self-respect, and combined it with the yearning of um, Black Americans, Black Caribbeans, Black Africans to be treated as equals, to live free from oppression, and, and mix those two things together, and that's what Garveyism was. And, and again, it rang all over the world. And um, one of the ways that that it it kind of drew people in is he created almost like a shadow culture, yeah, at, in Harlem at the at, at Unia, where like you would go to these meetings. He had like nightly meetings, right? But they were also like you know larger, bigger, almost conferences. And then there were huge conferences. But the smaller conferences might be like a day long thing where like the whole family comes and you have meals there, and you see like a vaudeville show there, and there's like a fashion show, and like that you split off into like breakout sessions to use horrific corporate buzz speak, yeah. um, where you would learn like a trade or maybe maybe be like drilled in military techniques or you would um, learn nursing and then be sent off to, to aid in natural disasters. Like you would learn stuff that the rest of society had shut you out from. This is where you could go learn it and, uh, you know, lift yourself up and in turn lift the whole culture up as, as everyone collectively was doing this. Yeah, it was, it's, the idea is really cool, I think, in that, You wouldn't just go to a meeting. And while there were for sure debates and Marcus Garvey just speaking about things, uh, I think he wanted to make it more interesting and inclusive. Mm -hmm. And that's why they would have concerts and fashion shows and stuff like that. Uh, The Black Cross Nurses was a big part of this progressive idea for uh, black women that he had. And obviously it's with a lot of the, as you'll see the naming conventions for things he did, it was a play on something that white people had done. So they had the red cross. He started the black cross nurses Mm -hmm. and uh, they were a a large organization that did like so much good work. 
And there was a lot of pride within that movement uh, of the Black Cross nurses. They had, you know, their own slogans. They had their own songs that they wrote. Uh, he had his fa- very famous phrase, up you mighty race. And it was, you know, I think he nailed it on the head. It wasn't just, um, it was a culture within a culture almost. Like he was starting, and in, in the years that he was doing this, the 1920s, I think just makes it all that more impressive what he was able to do. Absolutely. And another thing that he's credited with is, if not, um, I don't know if he invented it, but he certainly popularized the um, what's called the Pan-African flag. Um, mm-hmm. uh, usually it's a uh, three bars or three stripes. Good looking um, flag. Yeah, red, green, and black. I love those colors together. In, in high school, when I would go by those stores, uh-huh. something about the, the mat, those colors being together just like spoke to me. I was like, man, that's really a nice color combo. You'd be but, like, could I pull it off? No. I <laughs> it was like, a, I can't go there. But it was, uh, I, I just always liked those colors together. Yeah. And I always loved looking into those stores. Um, so, th- with the Pan-African flag, it's also called the African Liberation Flag. Um, and it's also the colors of Kwanzaa that would later be mm-hmm. um, founded in 1966. Um, the red represented blood, um, the blood that was uh, that united everybody of African ancestry, but also blood that had been spilled through enslavement, war, col- colonization. Um, the black represented black people as a, a whole nation. And the green was for the natural wealth of Africa. And that was a really big important point that I think Mm -hmm. um, Garvey tried to educate um, black Caribbeans, black Americans, and even black Africans, but probably to a lesser extent, about that was like, this is our homeland, and it's probably the most naturally wealthy continent on earth. Yeah. And we're all being treated like second-class human beings, and yet this is our homeland. What are we doing here? Let's We have to right this wrong, basically. And I think that was also like a big driver for why they were saying, we all need to go back to Africa and basically just say thank you for caring for this land. It's ours again now. Right. Uh, He uh, authored the paper Declaration of Rights of the Negro Peoples of the World, which was ratified with 20,000 people in attendance at Madison Square Garden in 1920, uh, which is an amazing accomplishment in and of itself. Mm -hmm. And this is where he was bestowed uh, the title of Provisional President of Africa. And I don't think we've said yet, one of the cool th- things about Marcus Garvey was the way he would dress. Mm-hmm. And he would outfit himself in this sort of military regalia with these uh, hats with ostrich plumes, mm-hmm. big ostrich plumes. And he was a big guy. So it was, you know, this this imposing figure comes in wearing this huge ostrich plume. Mm-hmm. Like this was a part of sort of the P.T. Barnum side, which was – to come into a room and grab everyone's attention and to make a statement and, you know, try and ignore me basically was what he put forward with how he carried himself. Right, right. But at the same time, it also made him a really easy target of ridicule among his rivals in in, um, the black cultural leadership. Um, Because, I mean, W.E.B. Du Bois wasn't wearing ostrich plumes. No, I mean, a lot of them called him a buffoon and said it was yeah. an embarrassment that he would dress up like that. But right, right. He was, he was, he was rocking his style. He totally was. And I, I, I'm with you. I, I respect that style as well. Um, but again, it did make him a, a target. And so did things sure. like being, being named the provisional president of Africa at the yeah. UNIA convention in Madison Square Gardens. These were things that like people could like pick on him for. But he was... His his idea was so strong because it was appealing to – while he was a, a polarizing figure, his ideas were unifying. They could take all different kinds of, um, you know, black concepts and black thoughts and black thinkers and black leaders and bring them all together and basically mm-hmm. say, yes, despite our differences, we are all in agreement. We This is a great way to lift people up. We might not agree with going back to Africa or not, but, but like, yes, we can come together as a culture and lift ourselves up. That like his ideas were unifying while he himself was polarizing. Should we go ahead and talk a little bit about the, the origins of the Back to Africa movement? Yeah, let's do that. All right. So this goes back. He is not uh, – he's far from the first person to have this idea. Uh, and like I mentioned earlier, one of the first people uh, was the first African-American millionaire. His name was Paul Cuffee mm-hmm. uh, or Cuffee, C-U-F-F-E-E. He was a mixed-race uh, Massachusetts sea captain. 
And his father was an enslaved African. And he had this idea that, and in fact, did so. He actually returned uh, at least several dozen African Americans to Africa and uh, to Sierra Leone. And this was in 1815. And then later, and I think we should totally do a whole podcast on Liberia. Yeah. Because the more I read about it, just the more interesting it is. But in 1816, the American Colonization Society, uh, which, you know, Andrew Jackson and James Monroe were members, they worked with West African leaders to basically say, let's establish this colony. It would eventually be Liberia. And over the course of about 40 years, I saw anywhere from 10 to 20,000 uh, free black Americans moved back to Africa. Yes, and, and lived in this new country that was granted to them, Liberia. And so, like, you could totally get, you know, um, crusty, musty, old racist, like, uh, 19th century Andrew Jackson and his cronies being like, yeah, let's, let's set up a country in Africa and send black people back there. Um, but this also appealed to, like you said, I mean, 12,000 free black Americans said, I'm out of here. So there yeah. was definitely, there was definitely, uh, again, there was, it's so so strange to look at, but there was agreement between racist white people and some black people who were like, we I, we just don't even want to be around you anymore. Let's just live separately. While there was also a, a very, I would say, a much stronger thread uh, in the black community is like, um... <laughs> I'm a 10th generation American, even though a lot of those ancestors of mine were enslaved. I was still born and raised in America, so were my parents right. and my grandparents. I really don't have any connection to Africa, aside from my further back ancestors having been enslaved there and brought over here. I don't really have any interest in going back to Africa. Can I support the idea of rising up as a as a black community, as a culture, without having to go back to Africa? And Garvey was like, mm, not really. No, we need to go to Africa. The races should not be intermingled. And that makes him a very polarizing figure, yeah. not just among the black community, among the white community as well. Yeah. And, you know, I, I think Liberia definitely deserves its own episode because I was reading into it and it was just really interesting, sort of the ups and downs and what happens when you have uh, you know, 20,000 African Americans moving to Africa mm -hmm. with their cultural identity that's somewhat confused and, mm -hmm. and melding with the locals there because it was, uh, it was just really interesting to see what happened over the years, it, like through the, you know, mid 2000s in Liberia. So, uh, I'm going to put that one on the list. Okay. It is officially <laughs> on the list. On the list. I, you made the sound and everything. I did. <laughs> Should we take another break before we talk about um, the Black Star Line and then some troubles? Yeah, things get really interesting here after the break, so stick around. Stuff you should know. Josh and Chuck. Stuff you should know. All right. So mm -hmm. you mentioned the Black Star Line. Mm -hmm. uh, and if you're listening, you might think, oh, doesn't Josh mean the White Star Line? No. No, he didn't. Uh, because this is the naming convention that I talked about. The White Star Lines was the, uh, I, I mean, it was the Titanic, right? It was part of the White Star Lines. Yeah, Cunard. Uh, and so Garvey said, you know what? We need our own industry. We need our own business. We need our own shipping. We need to be able to get people to Africa. So I'm going to start the Black Star Line in 1919, which was the steamship shipping company to facilitate shipping goods uh, around the African uh, diaspora and to literally uh, transport. I mean, the ideal was to transport uh, black Americans back to Africa. Mm -hmm. um, sadly, they never made it back to Africa on those ships. There were a host of problems, uh, including the fact that the ships that he ended up buying were almost all in pretty bad state of repair, like former World War I ships. So, you know, he was he was working with the money that he had, which he raised selling $5 shares at a time at meetings uh, and then getting into trouble selling them through the mail. Yeah, so with that $5 share, that was a big deal because that was a, a low enough price, about $81 in 2021 money, thank you, West Egg, um, that a, a working-class black family could 
could afford to buy a share in the Black Star line. And they were buying a share in like this actual like enterprise that had the had the legs to knit uh, black people around the world together economically and physically, like mm-hmm. ferry everybody f- around and around. And again, like you said, ultimately help everyone move back to Africa. Um, and, but this was even at a time that like the the average weekly wage earned by the vast majority of black Americans in northern cities was less than $5 a week. So it wasn't an yeah. easy $5 share to buy. But you can imagine how many families that were in Unia um, that scraped together the money or saved up for it to buy a share in the Black Star Line. And nothing I've read seems like the Black Star Line was ever meant to be anything but what it was stated to be. Mm -hmm. It's just that things went south because one of the things Marcus Garvey wasn't, by all accounts, is a shrewd businessman. He was not a biz whiz by any stretch of the imagination. And that, from what I understand, is ultimately what brought along the Black Star Line's downfall. Yeah, I mean, there was mismanagement. I read one story where uh, when they were doing some, you know, because they were trying to make money with this, like, you know, as a shipping company, too. Mm-hmm. So where a uh, a huge shipment of coconuts had gone rotten because he insisted on making these sort of high-profile political stops along the route, whereas the, I guess, the sea captains were saying, and these – these were completely operated by African Americans, uh, captained and crewed by African Americans, mm-hmm. mm-hmm. and they were like, "We need to, you know, if you want these coconuts to be sold and to actually profit in this company, we need to go straight there." And he insisted on stopping at different uh, places along the way, and he would, you know, things like that would happen kind of time and time again. It seems like, uh, and you know, like I said, these ships were in disrepair. The first one he bought. Uh, was the Yarmouth, uh, I think rechristened the Frederick Douglass. Mm-hmm. And it was a 30-year-old ship. Uh, one was called the Shady Side. He ended up buying two more. It eventually sank from a leak because of uh, storm damage from an ice storm. Mm-hmm. Uh, but, you know, they had some successes. I think I saw in the end, it ended up in um, in modern dollars being like a $20 million uh, outfit. It just didn't succeed financially. But, you right. know, it... That's a that's a lot of dough. So it wasn't like something he went into lightly, you know. No, and it was. I mean, that just goes to show you what an enormous enterprise it was. That 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 making twenty million dollars couldn't even allow them to break even. Yeah. Um, in addition to the the Black Star Line, he also um, helped found the Negro Factories Corporation, um, which created grocery stores, restaurant, um, moving vans publishing house, obviously, um, and all sorts of other um, black-owned businesses that not only were run directly from the Negro Factories Corporation, but also were just affiliated with it. And so part of the trouble that that Marcus Garvey ran into was, and that demonstrates he wasn't a very good businessman, is he was shuffling money from one enterprise to another to keep mm-hmm. them all afloat. And some were doing better than others. From what I understand, like the, the grocery store was doing really well, but say the restaurant wasn't. So he had to um, move money from the grocery store to the restaurant and then maybe from the restaurant to the Black Star line. And there was nothing that, that was so monumentally successful it could keep everything else going. And so, even knowing that, like, the Black Star Line was in serious financial trouble, um, he he would stop on those coconut runs to to try to sell <laughs> shares. That's one of the yeah. reasons why he was stopping was to, you know, um, rustle up membership in Unia and membership in Unia, subscriptions to the Negro World, um, and appearances by him um, – all also kind of came with pitches for buying shares in the Black Star line. And that's ultimately what got him in trouble. He was continuing to sell shares in an enterprise that um, he may or may not have thought was was in jeopardy. And the feds, who'd been trying to get him for years at this point, um, finally said, I think we can get him now. Yeah, what they got him for ultimately was mail fraud. And uh, what I saw was, it was specifically the fact that he was sending mailers for donations mm-hmm. or uh, not donations, but investment opportunities uh, that featured ships that they did not yet own. Mm. So uh, there was one ship in particular that he was trying to buy, but the the deal wasn't closed, but it was prominently featured. And they said, wait a minute, this is mail fraud. You can't uh, – you're misrepresenting the company essentially by having a ship on there that you don't have yet. And we've got you. And he ended up serving um, 
How many years? Just a few, right? He was sentenced to five, but I believe he served two. Right, and his sentence was commuted, and he was deported back to Jamaica. Yeah. Um, we're still going to talk about other stuff before this, but that's he ultimately ended up back in Jamaica. Uh, but when you were just talking a second ago, I think one of the things that is pretty clear was that he was a he wasn't the best businessman, but he was also a victim of over uh, being overly ambitious because he he had health problems through his whole life. He had pneumonia quite a few times, and uh, I think he had asthma, and I think he had a feeling maybe that he was not long for this world. So Mm -hmm. that's why he said, let's start theaters and let's start grocery stores and let's start restaurants and let's start a shipping line. Mm -hmm. I think he was overly ambitious and tried to move a little too fast maybe, Mm. whereas if he might have slowed down and put his efforts uh, into fewer things, he might have been a little bit more successful. Yeah, but also imagine being like, okay, we really need to make up for lost time. Well, yeah, you sure. know, and then feeling like your time on Earth was was yeah. was going to be shortened. I mean, you can't blame yeah, him. yeah, no, not at all. But so he um he did his time in Atlanta Federal Pen, which is uh, at the end of Grant Park now, um, which is one of the scariest buildings you can ever drive past. It's, <laughs> it's so imposing. imposing. Oh my yeah. goodness. Um, and and like you said, he thought his time in this world was going to be fairly short. And he actually wrote a letter from prison saying that, you know, um, he basically expected to, to die in prison. And if he did die, then he was going to come back. He said, look for me in the whirlwind. He was going to bring with him the souls of all the um, dead Africans who died enslaved um, and uh, basically right all the wrongs, if you know what I mean. That was the um, name of the PBS documentary, by the way. Yeah. I like our title more, Black Moses. I think that's such an amazing <laughs> name for him. It's so awesome. Yeah, it's good. But um, so he he didn't die in prison. He got out, like you said. Calvin Coolidge, uh, under tremendous pressure from UNIA um, members and uh, his wife, Amy Jacks, uh, finally said, okay, fine. He can come out, but he's going to Jamaica. And that's where he went. And when he went to prison, I mean, that was just not a good look. Like this guy who was leading the, the movement to prop up and raise up the black community going to prison, um, it, it just made him an e- even easier target, not just among the black community, but also among, like, white observers now, too. Like, look, you went to jail. Like, this is your, this is your leader? Come on, give me a break. But we haven't really kind of explained it enough, and, and there's a whole other podcast we could do just on this. But suffice to say, he was— very much the victim of government harassment, again, Mm -hmm. at the hands of J. Edgar Hoover, who somebody said once that he became so fixated on Garvey, it became basically a vendetta. He just wanted to get rid of Marcus Garvey and tried for years to do it. And the government sabotaged Black Star Line fuel fuel supplies so the ships would would break down. Um, Like, he was harassed. He, He had, like, every reason to feel persecuted and then finally put in prison on a pretty weak charge to begin with because of his ideas and because he represented a threat to, you know, white dominance in America and and elsewhere. Yeah, in uh, 1919, Hoover hired, and by the way, I thought you were going to quote me a second ago when you said someone once said about Hoover, I thought you were going to say that he was the worst American. (laughs) Right. It's like, wow, I'm already being quoted. (laughs) That would have been the most boss referential joke we've ever pulled off. Uh, so in 1919, uh, Hoover hired the Bureau's first black agent, James Wormley Jones. And you might think, oh, great, he's being progressive. No, no, no. He hired him specifically to be a mole and infiltrate Garvey's movement. And I think he was the one that actually poisoned the fuel lines. And he had other uh, moles that he would install within the organization. And it wasn't just um, – I mean, it's bad enough if you're doing that just to keep tabs and report back. Mm -hmm. But he sent people in there to agitate and to cause disruption. And I remember reading one story where there was something about letters being sent back and forth between different uh, UNIA uh, uh, offices in different uh, cities, like pretty far apart. And that they were agitating one another and with these letters. And it turned out that they were all written by Hoover. Or, Mm -hmm. you know, Hoover's cronies. Yeah, that's a playbook that little putz would be using for decades to come. He did that to the Black Panthers. He tried to do it to the civil rights leaders. Like, yeah, that was not like he would just he wouldn't put moles in just to like listen and report back. He was like he he put them in there to destroy them from within. Mm -hmm. 
which is just, you know, reprehensible. He, oh, man, what a snake. Yeah, and also, don't write in. I know what the word putt means, and I meant it with J. Edgar <laughs> uh, we should mention the um, attempt on his life that we kind of referenced earlier. Uh, this was back in 1919 in October. Uh, he had, by this time, this was kind of, uh, well, I guess Hoover was sort of already getting involved, but the New York DA, Edwin, uh, Edwin K., I'm sorry, Edwin P. Kilrow, Mm-hmm. started investigating uh, uni at first. In October of 1919, a man named George Tyler uh, showed up, uh, basically kicked in the door downstairs and demanded to speak with Garvey. Garvey came out to see what was going on. He opened fire. Uh, you mentioned that Amy Ashwood got between him and the bullets, mm-hmm. uh, but Garvey was hit three times, I think once in the scalp and twice in the legs. And the rumor was, uh, and this is, you know, I think what Garvey believed was that Tyler was sent by the DA. Uh, that was never proven. There were also people that said, no, this was a guy who was uh, had uh, restaurant dealings with him that was uh, angry about how that business went down. So I don't think we'll ever know for sure what happened, but there was an, ass- uh, an assassination attempt. So um, like I was saying before, when he when he went to prison, like it was not it was not a proud day for Unia, and Unia membership started to drop off fairly precipitously. Yeah. Uh, Amy Jacks' wife was um, trying to keep things going, publishing his letters, like giving speeches on his behalf, lobbying Calvin Coolidge to let him out of prison. Um, but the, it's just like the the death blow was kind of struck. Although that's yeah. not to say there's still Unia today, and mm-hmm. Marcus Garvey's views and Garveyism and a lot of his teachings and writings and thoughts are still very much espoused and followed. Um, Thank you, Peter Tosh. Right, and and not just in the reggae world, but um, he he uh, basically spent the rest of his life, and his life was relatively short. He died at age 52 in 1940. He moved back to Jamaica where he was deported. He decided to move back to London. I could not find what kind of connection he had to London to live there twice. Um, but that's where he lived out the rest of his days. And I mean, maybe because he schooled there. Maybe. But he, well, no, I knew he had an actual connection to London, but I meant like on a, an emotional level, like what, right. what drew him back to London a second time. But, um, but he died there, and he died just kind of like um, a bit of an outcast. Yeah. And one of the things that really didn't help, you know, he was kind of losing a lot of um, followers and adherents because he went to prison. And then later on, he he, um, he criticized Haile Selassie after he was deposed by Mussolini. And he also looked up to Mussolini for being a strong authoritarian leader. But the, yeah. the thing that really kind of like sealed his fate among um, the black cultural leaders is what you mentioned earlier, the bonkers meeting between him and the leader of the KKK, right? Yeah, I mean, uh, talk about a radical idea um, for him just to sit down with a leader of the Klan in Atlanta and and exchange views uh, of agreement on the fact that uh, they each thought that uh, black Americans should that belonged in Africa. Mm-hmm. To say that did not sit well within <laughs> the the leaders of the black community is is a pretty big understatement. Yeah. So that was, I mean, that was the, probably the biggest thing of of Marcus Garvey's downfall. But yeah, you know, because of that, his his image like really kind of he he died as an outcast in in yeah. London, um, and he. Um, he over the years though, like he was, it seems, he seems to have been first picked up and rehabilitated by the Rastafarians, who said like, "Hey, no, this guy, this guy had some amazing ideas. This guy was speaking truth. Like his his teachings were important." And they kind of picked up his um, his his uh, image and dusted him off and rehabilitated him. And people have kind of taken like a, a closer look at him again and been like, "Yes, this guy was one of the most important black activists in the history of the world." Yeah, I saw, I think in the PBS documentary, they put it like this, that he, uh, in the early 1900s, provided a template for everybody that came after, basically, Mm -hmm. Uh, whether it was Malcolm X or Martin Luther King Jr., uh, the the Rastafarianism, the Nation of Islam. Like, there were so many organizations and people that sort of used his life and his uh, cultural ideas as that template that um, it's it's... It's hard to believe that this is something, and we say this all the time, of course, especially about black history, but uh, I I don't think I ever heard the words Marcus Garvey 
in a high school or college history class. Not unless Peter Tosh was teaching. <laughs> oh, man, I miss, uh, we had this great radio station called Album 88 in Atlanta, the Georgia mm-hmm. State radio I miss station. It too. That every Sunday morning they had, uh, this, like the best reggae show ever. Yes. Uh, and it wasn't, you know, they weren't like, oh, let's play Redemption Song by Bob Marley. <laughs> Great song. <laughs> but it's where you could hear, God, all that early, uh, all that early ska. and Like Lee Perry and the Upsetters. And... Oh, man, it's so good. And now mm-hmm. when we go to the lake uh, on Sunday mornings, we just dial up a good, like, 50s and 60s ska playlist. Nice. In, in honor of uh, what, what once was at Georgia State. I think it you can still good. stream it online, but... It was a big deal. They they shut it down basically and said, "Let's have two NPR stations in Atlanta yeah, playing, playing the exact same thing at the same time." It was a terrible, terrible decision that yeah, I hope I'll one day they reverse because I hope eighty eight was so good. That was the more fire show, by the way. Yeah, and, then, and that boy that just opened my eyes to so much good reggae. When absolutely, I was in college and there was a lot of bad reggae. And then there was like. That was Saturday, I guess you said. That was Saturday around noon. And before that, in the mornings, they would have a Saturday morning cartoon music show where they play like strawberry shortcake <laughs> yeah, songs that. and like just like the most random stuff that they would get off yeah. of kids' records, but it was great. And then the night before that, I don't know if you remember Adam Bomb. Do you sure, remember him, Friday the DJ? Nights? Yes, uh-huh. like the soul, like, oh my goodness. The, the, like album 88 had it going on That's dot great. dash that was like trance and all that and then uh the uh reeling in the years was sort of you know for the old white folks i don't remember but, that but it was sure. it was really good deep cuts of of classic rock so that it's not like here's boston's more than a feeling it's like here's uh <laughs> this deep cut from steven still's second solo album right exactly yeah that, that was stuff. that was album 88 man man r.i.p album 88. r.i.p dare we do one on rastafarianism at some point Absolutely, because it's that, on my list is just—it's a tough one, I think. Yeah, I, I think so too. But with it, I mean, it suffice to say that Marcus Garvey was a prophet of Rastafarianism because he predicted the rise of Halia Selassie, who became the god of Rastafarianism. And we'll talk more about that in a different app. How about that? It's good stuff. I look forward. I believe it's Amazon <laughs> is making the Marcus Garvey movie, uh, but definitely see if you can find the PBS experience. American Experience, I think it is. Yeah. On uh, Marcus Garvey. It's good stuff. And the guy who's going to play Marcus Garvey, that was uh, Winston Duke. You were right. Yeah, the Winston dude from Duke. Us. Yeah. And uh, awesome. Black Panther, too. Um, well, if you want to know more about Winston Duke, go check him out on IMDb. But if you want to know more about Marcus Garvey, um, yeah, like you said, check out the, the American Experience on him. But there's so much stuff and great articles and interesting scholarship to read about Marcus Garvey and his legacy. So go check it out because it's pretty interesting. And since I said that, it's time for listener mail. Uh, I'm going to call this short and sweet because this was a longer episode. So this is perfect. Smart. Uh, When we did the episode on the church choir that didn't explode, we felt bad because we could not find Reverend Kimple's wife's first name. Mm -hmm. And wouldn't you know it, the stuff you should know, Army comes through for us. Yeah. Hey guys, love the show. Been listening for years. I heard the episode on the church choir that didn't explode. And you said you couldn't find Reverend Kimple's wife in her first name. And I was excited because I knew that the 1950 census had just been released on April 1st. So I guess in our defense, we recorded that before April 1st, right? Absolutely. Uh, I went and searched and they were listed in the census. Walter's wife's name, can we get a drum roll here? <laughs> is Eunice J. Klimple. We probably could have guessed in the 1950s. Eunice was probably a top five name. Uh, yeah. Or Evelyn. In in uh, in Beatrice, Nebraska, for sure. Yeah. Uh, I'm pretty sure it's them. Right county, right profession. Uh, and the only Walter Klimple. Yeah, I mean, Klimple with, without an E-L. That's got to be it. Mm-hmm. Uh, keep up the good work. And that was from a couple of people sent in, but this was from Sue. Thanks a lot, Sue. Yeah, I did notice a couple of people wrote in. So it's pretty sharp. The 1950 census has just come out and Sue sat bolt upright in bed and said, I got to look. <laughs> Thank I love you it. And that, that makes Sue uh, an official uh, research assistant. Unpaid. Exactly. Unpaid is right. So uh, if you want to be like Sue and send us some unpaid research, we're, we'd love that. That'd be great. Uh, especially if it's accurate. Um, you can put it in an email and send it off to stuffpodcast at iheartradio.com. 
Stuff You Should Know is a production of iHeartRadio. For more podcasts from iHeartRadio, visit the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows.